Hi everyone and welcome to the ACE webinar series. My name is Jackie Crockford and I'm an exercise physiologist and education specialist here with the American Council on Exercise. And today we have a great webinar planned for you entitled Running Injury Free, Understanding Impact Forces and the Loading Response. We have a great presenter with us today, Dr. Emily Splickle. Dr. Emily, thank you for joining us. Of course. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. Great. She's uh, she's all the way across the country, so we're in San Diego, and Dr. Emily is in New York, and she has a wealth of knowledge in this topic about, about running and barefoot running. She has... Uh, was the creator of Barefoot Training Specialist Program. She also is an advisor on barefoot research and has a, a large background in biomechanics and human movement. Um, and like I said, she is a part of an organization in New York. So serves a lot of different types of populations and I know has worked with some athletes as well. So she has a great background and a wonderful knowledge base that I am excited to learn for my own benefit here today. So. Uh, without further ado, I will let Dr. Emily take over. Go ahead, go for it. Thank you so much. All right, thank you guys, everybody, for tuning in. Um, I know everybody's time is very valuable, so I will make sure that we get the most out of this hour or 45 minutes. Um, as was introduced, I will be speaking about a concept of running injury-free, which um, I love this picture because it really is showing that not not many people are running injury free. All these people have braces on, and they're have probably orthotics, and they they have knee pain, hip pain, etc. Um, it's almost like an oxymoron or irony to think about running and injury free together. And when you really look at the statistics, we see that 70 to 80 percent of runners are getting injured, and it has always been these statistics. So even in the 1970s when we had the running boom, there were 70 to 80 percent of runners getting injured. If you look today, which is now 40 years later, 40 to 50 years later, we're still seeing 70 to 80 percent of injuries happening among runners. So, you know, the question has to be asked, is it running or is it the footwear and things like that. I try to look at it much more of um, the reality of the stress of the body when we're running and maybe physiologically our body is not designed to take that much repetitive stress without allowing sufficient recovery period. So then you eventually start to fatigue the body and then that's where we get injured. So this webinar is going to focus on hopefully a unique twist on running injuries and how we can actually prevent them by changing the way that we control our loading response. So that's going to be the focus over the next hour. A lot of the overuse injuries that we see in runners are our plantar fasciitis, our Achilles tendonitis, shin splints, runner's knee, IT band syndrome, stress fractures, um, etc. The list goes on and on. And a lot of these are overuse injuries. So for thinking about the concept overuse, we really want to ask ourselves, what does that mean? What is the overuse? What is that repetitive stress that is happening to the body when we're running? Well, we know that there's going to be a lot of impact that we are encountering. That impact and the impact forces of running is three to four times our body weight in ground reaction forces that we encounter with every step. Now, if we compare that to walking, walking is one to 1.5 times your body weight. And a lot of people get injured just walking. I see patients in my office who are getting stress fractures just walking to work, which that in itself should tell you how deconditioned today's society is for impact forces, that we can't even walk to work without getting injured, let alone run without getting injured. So really it's, it's taking a step back and looking at that stress. So we do have a repetitive microtrauma that is exceeding this reparative cycle, as I had mentioned. So how does your body perceive impact forces? How does your body load those impact forces? And then how do things like shoes and surfaces affect these images and uses them? So we have to delve a little bit deeper into 
impact forces. So if we're thinking about preventing running injuries, does this mean that we need to reduce the impact forces? This running boom is they started putting cushion in the shoes because they were seeing a lot of these running injuries, okay? Running has three to four times your body weight and impact forces, okay? Getting a lot of overuse injuries, a lot of stress factors, so we must design a shoe that's going to take the impact so that the body does not break down. That's an approach. Or we could look at at and say, well, how about we better train the body to take that impact versus putting something artificial on the body to take the impact. Again, a little bit different way of looking at it, and that's the way that we're going to be exploring that today. So our question that we need to ask ourselves when we're thinking about running injury free is, to avoid the overuse injuries, must we reduce the impact forces? And it's somewhat the impact forces but it's much more that we need to look at the loading response and what I see is that there is um, an error in the loading response that we're doing we're relying too much on the technology of the shoes versus training our body our foot to load those impact forces so we're gonna look at it a little bit differently a couple differences that we have between walking and running is first one I already mentioned that is the difference in impact forces when we walk we have 1 to 1.5 times our body weight in impact forces however if we pick up the pace and we go into a running pace now we have 3 to 4 times our body weight in impact forces if we pick the pace up even more and we start to do something that is jumping or high velocity we have up to 10 times our body weight in impact forces what's interesting is that the body is actually designed to take those loads it's the repetitive load that starts to break down the connective tissue in the body so something to think about another difference is that when we're running we have what is called flight time flight time is when there is no feet on the ground you're actually floating or flying in a sense and right before that foot contacts the ground for heel contact or foot contact there's a period of what's called free fall now this free fall happens both when we are walking and when we're running free fall is going to be a period where there's no muscle activation deceleration etc that's really where you get your, your first initial peak or spike of impact Another difference is that there is no double limb support, which means every single thing that's done or every single position when we're running is on a single leg. So we must be able to decelerate or take a load through a single leg. We must be able to balance through mid stance on that single leg, and then we must be able to accelerate or unload in a single leg. So of my, my runners that I treat, every single one of them is doing single leg deceleration and acceleration training. I think it's critical to every runner's program. So then we get to our million dollar question here. How can we reduce injuries in our runners? And this is something that shoe companies, they're trying to answer this million dollar question by changing the technology, switching to a minimal shoe, adding cushioning, be a maximal shoe, add some motion control. So they're really trying to use the footwear to answer this question. I try to bring it from a different perspective that our answer is already in our body. We are the technology of how we can reduce the injuries in our runners. So we're going to focus on two phases or two ways or components elements to this run injury free program first one is you have to train the body to take the load don't rely on the shoe you must train the body you must train the foot you must train your connective tissue to take that load second part of it is that you have to better allow the reparative cycle and the human body and the connective tissue particularly our bones are very intelligent in the sense of how they respond to stress. There is a theory called Wolf's Law, which means that as you stress the bone, you actually increase bone density. So wherever you start to stress, you create inflammation. But where there's that inflammation, if you back off and allow the bone to do what it's designed to do, your bone is actually stronger. 
So you can actually use that theory or that concept to build smarter feet for your athletes and your runners. So three ways as far as our loading response where the error lies is one, you must ask yourself, are you, your runners, your clients, your patients, do they have a delay in their loading response to the impact forces? Is there some sort of delay? We're going to go into that one a lot, particularly with shoes. Second question is perhaps they have poor control of the loading response. So can they perceive those impact forces? But once they perceive the impact forces, do they not know how to control that loading response? Third way that we want to look at ourselves is perhaps they're perceiving them. Perhaps they're controlling the impact forces. But for whatever reason, they are reaching their fatigue point, which is then leading them to no longer control those impact forces. So those are really the three ways that you have to be looking at it. And we'll look at those closer. So if we look at the first one, why is there a delay? Why do we have a delay in our perception of impact forces? What's happening when we put on our shoes? Right? What, what, what is it with the, the footwear that is blocking our perception of shoes? Well, for this, we need to look at the science of the bottom of the foot. As soon as you put on shoes, and I put this, or I say this a lot in my, my lectures and courses and certifications, is that as soon as you put on your shoes, you are in what's called a reactive environment. You are now in a delayed neuromuscular environment. You are in what is referred to as a large nerve proprioceptive environment. So a lot of things happen when you put on your shoes. And we're talking even minimal shoes, the Vibrams and the Freeze and the Minimus, etc., is that you just start to block that plantar skin. And the skin on the bottom of the foot is very powerful. It actually plays a very important role in how your body perceives impact forces. I ask this question a lot when I do different lectures, is how do you perceive impact forces? This was never taught to me throughout podiatry school or when I went to graduate school. It was post-research really looking at this concept of impact and injury. And if you're asking yourself now, how do we, how do we perceive impact forces? Is it the pressure? Is it, is it impact? Like what's the stimuli that's coming in that your body senses? What's interesting is that impact forces and ground reaction forces are actually vibrations. So your body perceives impact as vibration. Right here, these are the small nerves in the bottom of the foot or the small receptors in the bottom of the foot. They are very specific to different type of stimuli, whether it's skin stretch, different textures, maybe some pressure, vibration, light touch, etc. The one that we really want to focus on is here's the Pacinian corpuscles. You don't need to remember the name, but it is that perception of vibration. What's interesting is that 80% of the receptors on the bottom of the foot are sensitive to vibration, which means that if there's one stimuli that you want to be bringing into your body is vibration. It is our body's ability to detect vibration that allows us to know how hard we're striking the ground. It allows your body to know the compliancy of a surface. Is that surface hard? Is that surface soft? Is that surface slippery, etc.? It also gives your body the information to help you maintain balance. So as you're walking, you actually use vibration perception to maintain your balance during dynamic movements such as walking, running, etc. So we need to be bringing in that vibration. As soon as you put on your shoes and you have cushion, extra cushion in the shoes, that cushion is going to take your vibration, which means you have a delayed or an altered perception of the impact coming in. This means that you may strike the ground harder, which a lot of people will often associate, that when you have cushion in shoes, you strike the ground harder. As soon as you switch to a minimal shoe, you auto-adjust. What is allowing your body to auto-adjust is that you now have a more accurate perception of not just the impact, know that it is the vibration coming in. If we look here, a few things a little bit more about the vibration is that it's actually at a certain frequency. So if you remember tuning forks, if anyone went to um, 
any health practitioner school, medical school, physical therapy, you use a lot of the tuning forks. Every tuning fork is set at different frequencies. We must also think about like a power plate or a vibration platform. All of those vibrations are at different frequencies. The frequencies that particularly match the impact of running and that your foot and your lower leg response to is 10 to 20 hertz. Take it for what it is. What's interesting is that the frequency of impact that actually builds bone density is 15 hertz. So that's why they say impact exercises or activities actually builds bone density. It has to do with the vibration. That's how you build bone density. So what's interesting when we think about vibration is that your soft tissue, your muscles, your connective tissue actually does not like to vibrate. It does not like these vibrations, so it wants to stop the vibration. So we want to look at how your body stops these vibrations from coming in so you can actually use the impact forces as potential energy. So once you perceive those vibrations, how's your body going to damp it? Remember, soft tissue does not like to vibrate. How are you going to stop those vibrations. When you think about the answer to this question, think again about that tuning fork. So if you take the tuning fork or you take two symbols and you hit them together, you hit the tuning fork, it's vibrating, right? How are you going to stop the symbols or that tuning fork from vibrating? A lot of people know the answer that you're going to touch it, right? You're going to put your hands against it, you're going to put it against something, right? So what you're doing is you are actually doing an isometric contraction to stop the vibrations and this might be a new concept but it's a very exciting concept and it will completely change hopefully completely change the way that you look at running injuries and impact forces is vibrations come in you do not want the vibration so you do an isometric contraction when you contract isometrically what you do is you create what's called stiffness. So vibration, isometrics, creates stiffness. Stiffness creates or increases compartment pressure. Now this, this concept of compartment pressure, particularly in the lower legs, so we're thinking knee down, foot, knee. All of our muscles in our body, but we're focusing knee down, are housed in compartments. Those compartments are actually um, groups of muscles that are surrounded by fascia. That would be a compartment. Okay, So you have an anterior leg compartment where you have your tibialis anterior and your extensor digitorum longus, extensor hallucis longus, anterior compartment. You have a lateral compartment, you have a deep posterior compartment, superficial posterior, etc. All of those compartments when you contract the muscles isometrically, increases the pressure within that compartment. The higher the compartment pressure, the less the vibrations go through the muscle. Muscles don't want to vibrate, remember? So if you can damp the vibration, what you do is you allow the impact forces to become what is called elastic energy or potential energy. So just remember that concept, we'll go over it again. Another way that I like to give an analogy or something that fitness professionals really grasp onto is let's take for a moment intra-abdominal pressure or you're doing a brace, right? So the greater the pressure or stiffness that you can create in your core or intra-abdominally, the stronger you are, the more you're protecting your lower back. Right? If your client is doing an exercise, the more stiffness or pressure they can create in the intra-abdominal area, the more they will be able to squat. And they're going to have more stability when they're squatting. Now let me ask you, when you're doing a abdominal brace or you're doing an abdominal engagement to increase your intra-abdominal pressure, what type of muscle contraction are you doing? Hopefully you say isometric. Think of that the exact same way as this. The loading response is isometrics. That's how your body loads. That's how your body creates stiffness. Stiffness damps vibrations. So once we damp those vibrations, where are we going to store that potential energy, that elastic energy that I mentioned? Well, we store it in our 
connective tissue. Connective tissue meaning our fascia and our tendons. Now the tendon particularly that we store it in for closed chain movements, walking, running, jumping, etc., is going to be the Achilles tendon. Your Achilles tendon is the largest, strongest tendon in the body. It has the highest elastic recoil of any tendon in the body. It is where you house your elastic return during dynamic movement. So again, that's where a lot of our focus is, and that's why we focus knee down when we're looking at foot and ankle impact injuries. Here's a couple studies that support and show that a lot of our power does lie within the Achilles tendon or that our gastroc soleus, lower leg muscles, actually are contracting isometrically to allow that elastic energy to go into the tendon. Now something that you may be thinking is, well then how do our joints move? If we're decelerating and part of loading is ankle dorsiflexion, knee flexion, a little bit of eversion, right? So there's joints that are moving when we're loading. How are those joints moving if our muscles are contracting isometrically? That's where we go to our fascia. It's actually your fascia and the tendon fibers that are moving during the loading response and during those joint movements. It's not the muscle fibers. Think of it as the muscle contracting isometrically. The fascia is almost like a sheath that surrounds the muscle. So it is the fascia sliding or gliding over the muscle which allows the joint movement. It is that movement of the fascia and the tendons that actually loads it with potential elastic energy. So when you move through the next phase of running or walking, you get that elastic recoil. Something very powerful and has changed the way that I treat my patients. Every single one of my patients, I look at their injuries now through a different lens. So how do we damp quickly? So that's how we load, but we want to do it quickly, right? Are we going to do our fast twitch muscles? Or are we going to do slow twitch? That one probably makes a little bit sense of how you would answer it. Are we going to react to impact forces or do you want to anticipate those impact forces? So if we look at fast twitch versus slow twitch muscle fibers, what's interesting is that, remember isometric, so the faster you can isometrically contract your muscles, the faster you will create intracompartment pressure. That's the goal. So fast twitch reaches its peak muscle contraction at 70 milliseconds. Why understanding that time is important is because it takes or we load impact forces in less than 50 milliseconds. Okay, so you strike the ground, impact comes in in less than 50 milliseconds. It takes 70 milliseconds for your muscles fast twitch to meet their peak contraction, which means that if you react to impact, even if you're reacting with your fast twitch, it is not fast enough, which means we have to go back to our second question, do you want to react to movement or do you want to anticipate movement? Our goal is to ultimately anticipate the ground, which is where we're going to go back to barefoot training, barefoot science, looking at footwear, etc. You have to create stiffness that is anticipated before your foot even contacts the ground. So once you load, how is your body going to use those impact forces, right? We're going to use it as elastic energy. That elastic recoil is actually called the catapult effect. And if you've never heard of this, um, it's actually quite fascinating. A lot of the research around the catapult effect was done on kangaroos, where they're like, how is this animal can jump three times its height when all it has is this little foot? It has to do with the way that that animal loads and unloads the impact of every successive jump. Same thing, when we run and we store the Achilles tendon with that potential energy, what you're essentially doing is doing a catapult effect. You are doubling the impact forces so that you have higher potential energy. That's the way that your body wants to use impact forces. 
So if that's the way that we're supposed to load and that's the way that our body perceives impact forces, why are we getting injured? Right? Does it have something to do with how we perceive the ground? Do we go back to the loading response and maybe we can't control it? Or does it have something to do with our connective tissue and we have no way of controlling that potential energy? Or it might be a combination of all. So here we want to think about improving our perception or looking at smarter footwear. So the first one, right? We need to be able to perceive those vibrations. So I try to get all of my patients or a majority of my patients into smarter footwear. Smarter footwear meaning more minimal, something with less cushion. I don't want the shoe to take my patients or my runners vibration. Remember the vibration is your potential energy, your elastic energy. So if the shoe takes it, what are you going to use? Right? You are going to be working harder than you need to be. Those vibrations are there for a reason. You need to learn how to use them. As soon as you put cushion in the shoes, you take away your runner's potential energy. So studies have shown that if you put cushion in shoes, impact forces are actually higher or you strike the ground higher. Again, it has nothing to do with running techniques. I'll mention that in a little bit. It's not the strike pattern as far as heel strike versus midfoot strike, forefoot strike. I know there's a lot of debate around this, and I try not to go into that debate. I try to teach people the differences between the strike patterns and know when it's appropriate for what runner. But really what we need to look at is the shoes and the cushion in the shoes and how your body uses those impact forces. So you put cushion in shoes, you block your body's perception of vibrations. Vibration tells you how hard that ground is. If you think it's a little bit softer than it is, you might strike the, strike the ground harder, which means your impact actually goes higher. So we want to switch into a little bit more smart footwear. As far as the delayed deceleration, very, very important here. If you have a delay in your perception of impact, that will ultimately delay your deceleration, which means, again, we go back to the smarter footwear, but we must train the body to anticipate the ground. The way that we do this, and I'll mention it shortly, is going to be what's called barefoot before shod. What you are doing is you are doing barefoot movement prep every single time before you run. We're talking like five minutes of barefoot stimulation, start to wake up all those proprioceptors, wake up the intrinsic muscles, and wake up the way that your feet and your core and your deep hip are integrated so that now that runner can start to anticipate the ground and decelerate much faster. As soon as we fatigue, and I love this picture, <laughs> I think it's hilarious, as soon as we start to fatigue, what happens is yes, you delay your deceleration, but really what you're doing is you are compromising the rate at which you can create stiffness, the rate at which you can increase your intra-compartment pressure. And the way that this is compromised is that fatigue. So we'll start to think about um, lactic acid and the pH of muscles. So as soon as you start to change the environment through which your muscles contract, so let's say it gets a little bit more acidic from the lactic acid, that change in pH or that more acidic pH environment delays the way that the muscles contract. Our muscles actually cannot contract as well in an acidic environment. That's where lactic acid starts to create that heaviness. So fatigue starts to in set in, which means you cannot recruit those muscle fibers as fast. Maybe they don't go to their peak contraction. Your stiffness is compromised. The vibrations go through the soft tissue. They start to go into the bone. Now you have shin splints and stress fractures. That's the way that we want to start looking at it. So how can we start to improve our relationship with these impact forces? We know that we can no longer blame the shoes, etc. We need to be looking at our relationship. How can we alter this? Well, this is where we're going to do the barefoot before Shaw that I mentioned. And again, this is, we're talking five minutes, five minutes foot to core sequencing, barefoot stimulation, barefoot activation. These are the exercises that I have my runners do. 
and this will be five minutes, there is a link on the YouTube channel, the EBFA YouTube channel, which is called Run Injury Free. And there's a video where I show all of these exercises and I try to have my runners do them before they run. So, short foot, if you are not familiar with this exercise, again, please check it out. It's on the EBFA YouTube channel, youtube.com backslash EBFA fitness. Check out Run Injury Free. There's a video that says short foot. Short foot is going to be the exercise that activates the pelvic floor and sequences the foot with the core, which is ultimately the way that we load, the way that we decelerate, the way that we stabilize. So we are doing quick little repetitions, right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot. These are all single leg. That's important. You're going through stimulating five minutes, then you're moving on. So you would put your shoes on right after doing this five minutes, and then you would start running. I already mentioned that we would do the smarter footwear. So you would want to switch, make sure that everybody is in a more minimal shoe. If they need a little bit more uh, support, you can get the support into the shoe, but keep that cushion minimal. There's a lot of different features when it comes to footwear, and we're not talking anything about heel toe drop. We're not talking anything about the support and maybe a little bit of rigidity in that minimal shoe. What we're talking about is you have to keep the cushion in the shoe low or minimal. So any of these maximal shoes that you now see, I do not recommend those to my patients. And they're very, um, I would say the anti-barefoot. So try to stay away from the maximal shoes. You want a little bit more cushion. I do make orthotics for patients who are in minimal shoes. So if a patient's in a Nike Free, you can have an orthotic in a minimal shoe and it's not counter to what that shoe represents you're giving them the little bit of support but you're keeping the cushion minimal okay so just try to understand the different features with the shoes another thing that we want to understand is that we can actually control the impact forces coming in and this is very important to add as well footwear we mentioned strike pattern so this is where there's a lot of debate as far as heel strike versus midfoot strike there's a lot of argument that there are lower impact forces in a midfoot strike versus a heel strike. And what's important is that it's not necessarily the strike pattern, it's the footwear that's on. So you could argue and say that it's barefoot has less impact than shoes because of how you are striking the ground. Remember, you ultimately are still controlling some of those impact forces. If we look here, this was a study that was done um, 2012 and it looked at the impact forces from a midfoot strike versus a heel strike and it was shot in barefoot. So if you see um, the impact peak here, the black line is going to be the shod heel strike and what that shows is right here the second peak which is around 250 right so that's two and a half times the body weight there that is um, the peak impact of the shod heel strike the gray line is going to be the barefoot so that's actually showing that they're very similar so that argument a barefoot shod heel strike midfoot strike it's not the position of where you put the foot on the ground that affects the impact forces what does change if we go back to the strike pattern, look at number four is going to be the stride length. To me, that's the most important thing. And when you get a heel strike runner, many times where you see their injuries is when they're overstriding. What happens when we overstride is that, if we look at this picture here above, what happens when you overstride is you change the angle of your ankle. And the sharper that that angle is, so if we can see that he has a sharp 90 degree dorsiflexion angle of the foot, the sharper that angle is, the higher the impact forces. If that foot were to be a little bit more level with the ground when you strike the ground, so it would actually be a greater angle, you actually have less impact forces when you strike the ground. The longer the stride, the sharper the dorsiflexion angle, that's what's increasing the impact forces. You shorten the stride, 
you drop that foot down, you have a greater dorsiflexion angle, you have less impact forces. So something that you want to think about, ankle dorsiflexion, that angle, very important. If you're assessing your runners, use a high-speed camera, freeze frame it, measure that angle, and try to teach them to drop that angle to be a little bit lower. As far as stride length, if we look at a midfoot strike versus a heel strike, part of why I like a midfoot strike is because it's associated with a shorter stride. So it's the shorter stride, not necessarily the heel versus the midfoot that is controlling the impact forces. So shorten the stride, increase that dorsiflexion angle or make it a larger angle. And then we want to think about surfaces. So surfaces is huge and this may not be something that you focus on too much. Every surface vibrates differently. So whether you are on the basketball court that's going to give a different vibration than this track that is suspended above it. The dirt, or if you're doing trail running, is going to vibrate different than the concrete or the street. Right? A treadmill is going to vibrate a little bit differently. So where injuries happen is when runners are switching different surfaces. And you'll actually, when you, when you start to think about this, you actually might be like, oh, you know what? That's right. So I start seeing in my patients that the warm weather, right? So everybody switches from running on a treadmill to now they're running outside. I get a huge spike in impact injuries in my office from that because what they're doing is they're assuming that, hey, running is running, five mile is five mile. And we're not making an argument about treadmills and the differences between, you know, the belts moving and all of that, but it has to do with the impact is their muscles and the way that they create stiffness and damp those vibrations is different than on the street when they're running. Your body actually starts to pre-program its loading response. And this is based on the research of Dr. Nig, N-I-G-G, fascinating researcher out of Canada. And what he showed is just after several steps, your body has pre-programmed the loading response. So your body already knows how many impact forces are coming in. So it is actually creating stiffness to a certain degree before that foot even contacts the ground. What happens if your runner is switching and one day they're indoors and then the next day they're outside, their nervous system is so confused that they cannot anticipate the accurate degree of vibration. This theory is called the muscle tuning theory. And again, it's, it's um, developed by Dr. Nig, muscle tuning theory, and it means that your body anticipates, and your body must anticipate, the accurate frequency of vibrations coming in to not get hurt. As soon as there's a mismatch between that frequency, that's where you start to get injured. So another goal would be to offset fatigue. So one way that we could offset fatigue would be with our recovery. Make sure that your runners are not doing it um, running every single day. When I have new runners or runners who are coming out of being injured, we're talking severe injuries. I have some runners who have not been able to run for one to two years because of chronic injuries. What you need to do when they return to running is I tell my patients not to run two days in a row. So allow a 48-hour period. And what you're doing is you're allowing that inflammatory cycle to go through and decrease. So stimulate, stimulate the connective tissue, right? Start to stimulate the bone, but then back off and let the body repair itself. You do that enough times and you will actually be stronger. Somebody told me before that there was a martial artist um, and a Muay Thai martial artist and he would kick a tree, kick a tree every day and what happened is through that repetitive microtrauma, if you're kicking a tree with your shin, you're going to be microtraumatizing it. He would do it and then he'd back off. Just do a few kicks and then back off. What happened after so many years of doing that, he had the strongest tibia or shin bone out there because that's Wolf's Law. That's what you're doing is you're stimulating the bone. Think the exact same thing. Stimulate back off. Do not stress that connective tissue 48 hours in a row. 
Another way that we can offset that fatigue is with what is called compressive sleeves. And a lot of people, you probably seen runners running around with the compressive sleeves you might use them yourself um, compressing garments are something that's kind of um, the trend now and a lot of people focus on the compressive sleeves for recovery and where the recovery it does help and there's research that does show that it can accelerate the recovery especially in endurance athletes um, the way that I like compressive sleeves has to do with again that compartment pressure so let's think of the compressive sleeve as like a weight belt. Not, not in a bad way, but the compressive sleeve is like a weight belt. So if you are doing heavy weights and you do the weight belt, a lot of times why the weight belt is used is because they cannot generate enough intra-abdominal pressure to resist the load that they're lifting. So what you're doing with the compressive sleeve is the compressive sleeve is increasing the intracompartment pressure so that the muscles don't have to work as hard. Now where this would be good is if you have a runner who currently has shin splints, um, you have a runner who is running on surfaces that might be associated with higher impact forces and you're trying to prevent shin splints and stress fractures from the get-go, smart way to do it. Um, you could just do it in general kind of offsetting fatigue um, type of programming. So it, it's not in a negative way. I don't see it as a crutch. I see it as a smart way when you understand how those compressive sleeves work. An example real quick of how we would use it is um, I was doing a workshop and I had a high school track coach taking one of my trainings. And she had said, this was in Chicago, and she had said that um, if Right, beginning of track season or preseason, it's snowing, they have no choice, they're not going to be outside. So that what they do is they'll have the sprinters run down the high school hallway, and which sounds awful, um, but they would be sprinting. So they would do, you know, a pseudo 100 meter dash, 50 meter dash down the high school hallway, and she would say every time they would do that, these poor kids would start getting shin splints and Achilles tendonitis. You know, and these this is preseason, so you don't want them to get injured before the season even starts. What was happening is that those athletes were sprinting and encountering very high impact forces on concrete. The thing about concrete that's different from other surfaces is that when you strike the ground there should be this, this mutual relationship between contact. Is if you hit two things together, you want to vibrate, but you also need the surface to vibrate. And think about that of like a wood floor, like an old school dance studio wood floor. You hit it, it vibrates, perfect. That's exactly what you want. If you hit concrete, that concrete's not vibrating. Those vibrations are reverberating higher into you. So these poor athletes were getting injured. So I told her, use the compressive sleeves because it helps take some of that stress that is unnatural to those runners. Another way that we can prevent these injuries is to allow that reparative cycle. So remember that I had said, give that 48-hour period. What happens during that inflammatory cycle is that you get this localized microtrauma. So you get, let's say it's with your Achilles tendon or your fascia, your connective tissue. You get tiny little micro tears. Think almost like if you're doing a heavy, um, eccentric, hypertrophy training workout for your muscles. What gives you the pain and the soreness of your muscles is you're micro-tearing your muscles, right? In that environment, it's good. But that's also why you don't lift two body parts or the same body part two days in a row, right? You allow that micro-trauma cycle to go and repair and build new, new muscle fibers, etc., so that you actually hypertrophy and get stronger. Same thing with your connective tissue. Micro tear the tendon or maybe start to inflame the bone, right? What happens with that inflammation is that your tissue actually becomes weak. Anytime there's inflammation around tissue, connective tissue, it becomes weak. So you do not want to continue to stress it. You want to back off and allow that weak inflamed tissue to now repair itself. What happens when it repairs itself is that the micro tears are replaced with tissue that's almost like scar tissue. So we need to be doing 
eccentric release of this scar tissue. So eccentrics is huge, should be the foundation of everyone's program. As far as our fascia, if your fascia starts to get little adhesions and inflammation, that's where you start to get the little knots, cross links they're called, right? So doing myofascial release during this 48 hour period is very good. If you start to do that eccentric training and the myofascial work, then you bring that elasticity back to the, to the tissue. What's happening and why people get injured is they push into this inflammatory cycle and there's what's called a tissue stress theory. If you keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and you don't allow this reparative cycle to happen, your tissue will break. I don't care what shoes you have on, I don't care who you are, right? We're all humans and we have the same connective tissue. So kind of understanding this and building this into your running or your runner's program will be very powerful. So fascial flexibility, that was kind of that last part of that reparative cycle. Remember that your potential energy lies within your connective tissue, your fascia, your tendons, etc. So you need to keep it flexible. Doing myofascial work also should be the foundation to preventing running injuries. Last thing that you can do to help your connective tissue is to understand that there are some supplements that help as well. And I recommend these to a lot of my runners and to my patients in general. Is these are some different supplements that are very good for protecting your connective tissue. Connective tissue meaning tendons, fascia, bones. Right? So these are and this are the exact recommendations that we give. Benfotiamine controls your glucose or your blood sugar. It prevents your body from making stickiness or free radicals in the body. Carnosine is also very protective of your connective tissue. Same thing with l lysine and vitamin C as well. So these four are very simple to take. They're all water soluble. I tell patients to take them in the morning and then they're out of the way. But a very powerful way of protecting fascia, tendons, bone. Because that's where your potential energy lies. So. Before we go into any questions that you guys might have, um, I again want to apologize for the little drop off, um, but we totally jump right back in. Um, to summarize on it, I think some of the key pearls or points that we want to take away is that one, impact forces are perceived as vibration. How your body perceives that vibration is through the skin on the bottom of the foot. As soon as you put on shoes, you start to block that perception of the vibrations. Once you get those vibrations that are coming in, the way that your body damps or loads those vibrations is through isometric contractions or by increasing the stiffness of our compartments. Now the faster and the higher you can achieve that stiffness, the more protected you will be at foot contact. Now if you start to get fatigued and you delay the rate at which you can create that stiffness, now the vibrations transfer from the muscles into the bone and you get your stress fractures, your tendonitis, etc. When we look at programming, it's very powerful to do a barefoot stimulation or activation so that you, one, sequence the foot to the core because that's how we load, but you also keep those receptors on the bottom of the foot very um, good. By wearing smarter footwear and decreasing the cushioning in the shoes, you get a more accurate transfer of vibrations into your foot and into your skin understand different surfaces. Every surface vibrates a little bit differently. You have to allow an adaptation period to those different surfaces and vibrations so that what you anticipate matches the true vibration. You can use the compressive sleeves as a very powerful way to help increase your compartment pressure, especially if you have an injured athlete or you are on a surface, let's say concrete, that is associated with higher than normal impact forces. You can start to integrate myofascial work because that's where your um, connective tissue or where your elastic energy lies. You want to remember that inflammatory cycle, especially for a runner that's coming back in from an injury, is stress it back off, stress it back off, and allow the body to become stronger through that reparative cycle or what's referred to as Wolf's Law. 
Last one would be with these supplements, is that there's a very powerful way to add and strengthen our connective tissue, especially as we age, we start to lose that elastic recoil, or if there is a history of any connective tissue injury, such as Achilles tendonitis, plantar fasciitis, you want to keep that connective tissue protected, and some of the supplements that I had mentioned are very powerful. So. I hope that you guys learned a lot, and if there's any questions, I will have Jackie go through those, um, and I will also be answering some on Facebook. Great. Thank you, Dr. Emily, for that. Just, uh, my mind is blown right now. I'm, I'm thinking about all of the, the different topics that you covered in such a short amount of time, and so I, there are quite a few questions that have been coming in, and thank you guys for posting those. Just to remind everyone before we get into a few of these questions, it is past the hour at this point, and because we did have a little bit of technical issues, we will be posting um, a copy of this uh, webinar up on YouTube at a later date in case you wanted to review that. Uh, you will be getting an email reminder with that link, and I have also uh, given you within the chat box of your GoToWebinar dashboard, I have posted the link for the YouTube videos that Dr. Emily referenced as far as the, the barefoot uh, warm-up, that, that five-minute barefoot warm-up, and I have also posted a link for the ACE Facebook chat. So if we do not have time to get to your questions today, we're just going to take a couple of minutes here, and if you do not have time to get to those, you can ask Emily a question. Dr. Emily will be answering a few questions for us on our Facebook chat page, and I have posted that link within the chat box. So, like I said, there are many, many questions coming in, so we'll just take a couple here, and Dr. Emily, I wanted to just uh, touch a little bit on what you just finished on as far as the supplements go. Everyone that's listening, mm -hmm. please remember your scope of practice for your uh your professional credentials. Dr. Emily has a lot of credentials that allow her to, to talk a little bit more in depth about supplements with her clients, and so I just want to be sure that everyone is aware that, um, that supplements carry a little bit of a different area as far as the, the fitness professional, certified fitness professional goes, so please be aware of your own scope of practice for the, the credentials that you do carry uh, as far as uh, recommending supplements to your clients. So I just want to uh, make sure that we all understand that, and it sounds like uh, Dr. Emily has uh, some information on supplements that are uh, have some positive impact, but we just want to be sure that we're directing our clients through um, through research like this that, that gives us a good idea about what, um, what we should be looking for. So as far as scope of practice goes, please keep that in mind, um, but it's good to understand the... The, the supplements that are that are out there that maybe your clients could ask you questions about. So thank you for bringing that to our attention, Dr. Emily. Um, one of the questions that seems to kind of be a theme here, uh, everybody's been typing in their questions and go to webinar, is what do we do with clients who already have an injury or who already have um, maybe some kind of uh, mechanical issue um, biomechanics or you know just the, the shape of their foot or, or bones or whatever you want to call it um, that is preventing them from having uh, maybe a, a normal running gait or you know something that they're already coming to you with that, that we're having to deal with um, you know do you look at those clients in a little bit different light as far as trying to to correct them biomechanically or what's your take on on clients that are already dealing with an issue sure so um, this is like an hour answer but yeah <laughs> I will speak that. just this a is a whole other PowerPoint right <laughs> yes uh, so let's say someone one of your um, uh, runners or clients has had let's say Achilles tendonitis or it could be plantar fasciitis any type of itis and yes if we, we had, had a lot of questions for... about those so yes go go oh, with okay. go with the itises yes okay the itises so let's say you have to look at all these itises and this is where I do see a little bit of a disconnect in the industry um, so I'm, I'm super glad that you guys asked this question is they have this itis how, how long have they had that that's what you need to ask if they've had it for less than three months 
right? So a couple months. It's now considered still acute. So is it acute? When it's acute, what your goal is is just get that inflammation down. Get the stress off of the tissue. They should not be running, obviously, at this point. So stop running. Get the stress down. Get the inflammation down. Take oral anti-inflammatories. I do do some steroid injections for plantar fasciitis, never for Achilles tendonitis. Do the myofascial work. Do the foam rolling, et cetera, et cetera. But stop stressing the tissue so you can get that inflammatory cycle to get down. If they continue to stress it and it becomes now chronic, which means they've had it for greater than three months, or sorry, six months, greater than six months. Once they have it greater than six months, what happens is the connective tissue has actually changed its consistency. So it is no longer um, like a young and healthy rubber band where we want our fascia and our tendons to be young and healthy like a rubber band. The more you start micro-traumatizing it, like you stress it, little tear, stress it, little tear, it becomes more and more like a dried out rubber band. It becomes degenerated. So that's after six months, which means they're not going to respond as well to everything that you do for acute patients, like the stretching and the rolling and the breaks and the anti-inflammatories and et cetera, et cetera. They don't respond as well. So you have to understand where are they first. If it's acute, much easier. Get that inflammation down, then reassess their movement pattern. If their movement pattern is driven by, let's say, a flat foot, okay, then you have a choice. Do you want to correct that client's flat foot? Do you want to put them into orthotics? When I look at flat feet, you either have super mild flat feet that you couldn't even tell they have a flat foot, which is like not a flat foot. You have mild, which means, okay, they have a little bit. You can kind of see it, but it's nothing crazy. It's not causing knee valgus or the knees to knock in. It's not creating any sort of lordosis, et cetera. That falls under mild, okay? As soon as it becomes a little bit more severe that you're like, well, maybe they should go see a podiatrist because I, I don't know. This is a little bit more than I'm used to. Use that as your moderate thing. Those you're going to start to refer and get a second opinion with a podiatrist. Um, those that fall under the mild, let's say just a little bit of a drop, very rarely do I put them in orthotics. Reason being is that research has shown that by strengthening the glutes, so you do six weeks of glute medius, glute max strengthening, and you can correct that mild flat foot and pull them into neutral. So it's a very powerful, that's where you would start looking at your corrective exercise is in that mild. As soon as they're a little bit more moderate, maybe we need to look at, at some orthotics. And then that orthotic might alleviate some of the extra stress that the running is putting on the foot, and then that will fully alleviate their Achilles tendonitis and their plantar fasciitis. Okay, so that's how we start looking at those. For the one that is chronic, because you will have some clients that are runners and they've been dealing with plantar fasciitis for a year or something. What I would do is they need something to get that connective tissue to be young and healthy again. And this is where there's a huge void, especially in fitness, because they, they tend to forget that our tissue actually dries out and degenerates like this dried out rubber band. There are techniques, and this is just so you understand that you're not doing it, but you could refer and know that there's options that exist to get that connective tissue like a young, healthy rubber band again. You may have heard of platelet-rich plasma, PRP, right? That's something where they draw out your blood, spin it down, take the platelets, and inject it back into the tissue. There's something that's called a bone marrow aspirate, which is growth plates and stem cells. You have amniotic membrane, which is growth plates and stem cells. There's all these things and procedures and injections that can be done to stimulate the tissue to become a young, healthy rubber band again. Once you get that connected tissue to be a young, healthy rubber band again, then we go back to our question, where are their biomechanics? Are they little this way, little that way? Do they need to be in an orthotic? Do you just need to strengthen the foot? Do you just need to do deceleration training with them? Do you just need to get on like a, a glute strengthening? Right, like where are you with that? So we kind of want to um, 
look at it very localized, like what's the health of this connective tissue, and then look at it globally, what's the movement pattern of this client. And you have to, continuously through their program, you have to look zeroed in and then back up and take the whole picture. Go back in, zero in, look at the whole picture. Um, I hope that answers the question somewhat. Um, where I do see a disconnect is that everybody's trying to do this roll, ice, blah, 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 that you do for the acute with chronic patients and they never get better and they keep banging their head against the wall and the reason is because that connective tissue has changed its composition. That's a, that's a great way to, to, to summarize <laughs> that, that obviously you're right, we can talk about that for a, a whole other webinar series, um, but it sounds like we just need to start from the beginning and understand the uh, understand the injury or you know whatever is going on and how long our client has been suffering from that to really grasp our our protocol and and where we should go from there so um, so thank you for that I'm gonna ask you just just one or one more question here we'll go maybe another two minutes to uh, what I have is 1215 okay. here on the um, on the West Coast so uh, you talked a little bit about using the compression sleeves and mm -hmm. a couple of people have wondered about the compression sleeves and they their use during or after running or if it's the sleeves or the socks that are appropriate. So a couple of different ways to answer that. Um, if it's during or after running, that's, that's most appropriate. Or if it is the sleeves or the socks that will help the most. Okay. Yes. So now I have a very short time and I'll try to do this very quickly. Um, so with compressive sleeves or compressive slots, compressive garments, etc., all compressive garments are graded. And this is important to note, is to know that they're graded, not just like, ah, oh, does this feel good, does this not feel good? They're graded. They're graded on what's called a millimeters mercury. So MMHG, millimeters mercury, is how you grade compressive garments. Anything that is less than 25 millimeters mercury, you can get over-the-counter, not prescription. So that would be all of your running shoe store compressive stocks, compressive sleeves, etc. Okay, anything that is too low, like a 10 millimeters of mercury, is not going to do anything. And I would say would be a little bit more towards the recovery side of things. Um, I would recommend doing more. A majority of the socks are probably much more towards recovery. Why I would also not do a sock and I would recommend the sleeve is that if you start compressing the foot a little bit too much and it's in its shoe and you're running and then you get a little bit of swelling, now you start to put pressure on the nerves and the foot falls asleep. So I just wouldn't mess around with the foot. I would go into just the calf sleeve. I would try to make sure that it's a little bit higher um, pressure, so more towards that 20, 25 millimeters mercury. There's a brand that's called Zensa, Z-E-N-S-A-H, which is probably the best compressive sleeve for shin splints. And it is a graded compression. So it increases the compression or it's, it's decreasing as it goes from distal to proximal. So it's actually trying to work with uh, venous flow to work with the compression. So um, I would recommend doing the calf. You do it when you're running. You do not do it after. So it's designed to be during running, higher compression, just calf sleeve. If you're doing it for shin splints, I would also have my runner do it when they're walking. Wear that compressive sleeve for a good, I would say, four weeks. If you have active, like, clinical shin splints and you're like, I think I might have a stress fracture, four weeks compressive sleeves, whether you're walking or you're running. I would actually back off from the running. If they can do more like an alter G running, that would be great. And then when they go back into their running program, I would do dynamic, ballistic training on the surface that they're going to run on, but don't run yet. So anything jumping, jumping, jump, jump, don't run. Just do it on the surface and start to get used to those impact forces again. Okay, yeah, that and was, that was perfect. Yeah, that, that's a great, great answer. Thank you. Um, so that was Zensa, and we're looking for 20 to 25 millimeters of mercury 
I uh, just wanted to reiterate that for, for those of you that are following that question. So thank you again, guys, for joining us for this uh, live webinar. Apologies again for the technical issues. Thank you for hanging in there with us. Thank you, Dr. Emily, again, for joining us. If you would like to gather any more information and get CECs for this course, we have the link for our course page, and there it is right there, acefitness.org forward slash run injury free, and you can purchase this recorded version and quiz should you like to receive CECs for today's course. Thank you again for joining us. Have a healthy day.